one. Listen to the news report about a robbery, and then complete the notes from the detective's notebook. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. There has been an armed robbery this morning at the Halifax Building Society's branch in Edward Street. John brings us at the scene with Detective Sergeant Henry Lawson. Detective Sergeant, can you tell us what you know about the robbery? Yes, the raid took place this morning, shortly after eleven thirty, when a man accompanied by a woman went into the offices of the、uh, building society and asked to see the manager.、Uh, there were no other customers in the building at the time. They were let into the manager's office, and the woman produced a gun from her handbag. Then they took the manager back out of his office and made him tell the cashiers to hand over all the money they had in the tills and in the safe. Uh, it came to about twenty-five thousand dollars. Presumably, you have a number of witnesses. Yes,、uh, we have a good description of both of them. Uh, the man was about one meter eighty centimeters, around thirty-five years of age, with blue eyes and short, curly red or ginger hair. He was wearing jeans, a green sweater, and a three-quarter length blue coat. When he spoke to the cashier when he came in, he called himself Mister Erickson, but we doubt whether that is his real name. But we do know that may be his real name. He also spoke with a strong Scottish accent, which may help us to trace him. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. And what about the woman? Now she is in her early twenties, slim and quite tall, about one meter seventy centimeters. She was wearing a long white raincoat, which was quite loose fitting, and which she didn't take off. She had a beige handbag. Which they used to hide the gun in. She's got straight, shoulder-length blonde hair, blue eyes, and like the man, has a noticeable accent. Do you have any other information? Yes, the car they used was seen by two or three people. It's a blue or dark blue Ford Escort, and we have the registration number, and it's G five nine five E R I. I'll say that again. It's G five nine five E R I. Now the car was stolen from Bishopstone just over a week ago. So if anyone has seen it in the last week, we would like to hear from them. We also know that the car's front left headlight was broken when it was stolen and is still broken. We think. So you would like information from the public about the car? Yes, and the people. We're appealing to anyone who thinks they may recognise the two robbers or know anything about the car. We've set up an incident room in Swindon, and the telephone number is double seven four five two nine. So we would like people to ring us if they have any information.、Uh, and of course, all calls will be dealt with in the strictest confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the number again, if you have any information, 
is double seven four five two nine. And now back to the studio. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Section two. You are going to hear a lecture about dining services. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen to the tape and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Welcome to the dining commons. This is the newest facility on campus, and I am proud to say, also one of the best. I know that all university students miss eating home cooked food. Well, this year we are hoping to provide students with food and services that will make you feel at home, even without your family. The administration has been listening to the voice of the students. Students gave us frequent suggestions last year as to how we could improve the university. One of the most frequent suggestions was improving the dining options. We have been working hard all summer to come up with ideas that will make student life in the dormitories more pleasant. One of the new options we are offering in the dining facilities. Is variety in student meals. Last year, there was a set menu for every dinner, so if students didn't like the food, there was no choice. Students had to eat whatever was served. But this new dining facility has three completely unique areas, each with a different theme. At every meal, there will be three options for students to choose from. For example. There might be Italian food at station number one, which might consist of pizza and pasta. At station number two, there would be American food, consisting of hamburgers and hot dogs. At station number three, there could be vegetarian soups and salads, accommodating all the vegetarians. We hope that with the greater selection of food. All students will find something to their liking. Now look at questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen to the tape and answer questions fifteen to twenty. Not only will students have more options, the food will also be better. Each section of the facility will have a head chef. These are real chefs that have been trained in culinary school, and have been hired specifically by the school to work in the dining facilities. All of the chefs have a speciality. The school is hoping that these chefs will prepare better-tasting and more nutritious food. Every student will be able to make suggestions, and also give their input as to which menus taste better. Last year, many students complained that the dining facilities didn't have very convenient hours. This year, we hope to change that. We will open for breakfast at six a.m. to accommodate all the early risers. In the evenings, we will open until midnight for all the students that like to go for a late-night snack. The afternoons will still remain closed. 
but we will have a student store open that will provide all students with drinks and fruit. The student store will be open every day from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Every student that has paid full tuition and dormitory fees has already paid for their dining facility fees. Students can eat at any time and in any amount for free. If you are a student that does not live in a dormitory, you can still purchase a dining facility card. This card will entitle you to the full services of the dining facility. This card is available only for students and is not open to the general public. If you are not a student and wish to dine here, you must purchase meals at the door. There are a few rules to follow. Even though we do not limit the amount of food that can be taken, we do not want students to waste food. Please do not take more than you can eat. Also, every student must clean his or her own trays and plates. We will provide plates and trays for student use, but please do not abuse these items. Please do not leave your plates on the tables. Your parents are not here to clean up after you anymore, so I hope all students will be responsible. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the upcoming year. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two geography students, Jack and Katie, talking about a field trip to Kenya in Africa. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Katie, hi. Thanks for inviting me round. Oh, thanks for coming. I know you're up to your neck in finals revision, but I've got to make up my mind about next year's geography field trip, and I'd really like your advice. We've got to choose between an African trip and one in Europe. They've told us a bit about both trips in the lecture, but I really can't make up my mind, and I know you did the African one last year. That's right. So, where exactly did you go? I mean, I know it was in Kenya, in East Africa. Yes. Well, we were right up in the northwest of the country. It was beautiful. We stayed in a place called the Marich Pass Field Studies Center. Right. Dr. Rowe said the accommodation was traditional African-style cottages. Uh, he had a special name for them. Bandas. Yes, they're fine. You have to share two or three people together. They're pretty basic, but you have a mosquito net. They don't provide spray, though, so remember to take plenty with you. You'll need it. <laughs> and there's no electricity in the field centre. You'll have hurricane lamps instead. They give a good light. It's no problem. What about places to study? Dr Rowe said there was a library? Yes, but it's quite small. There's a lecture room as well, but most of us worked out in the open air. There are plenty of places outside, and it's so beautiful. You're right in the middle of the forest clearing. I gather it's a relatively unmodernised area. Definitely. They actually set up the centre there because it's on the boundaries of two distinct ecological zones. The mountains, where the people are mainly agriculturalists, and the semi-arid plains lower down, where they're semi-nomadic pastoralists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So, how much chance did you get to meet the local people there? Did you get the chance to do interviews? Yes, though we had to use local interpreters, but that was okay. Then we did field observation, of course, looking at environmental and cultural conditions, and morphological mapping. What's that? Oh, looking at the surface forms of the landscape, the slope elements and so on. What about specific projects? Yes. After the first two or three days, we spent most of our time on those. We could pretty well do what we wanted, although they all had to relate to issues concerned with development in some way. People did various things. Some were based on social and cultural topics, like the effect of education on the aspirations of young people. And some did more physical process-based studies, looking at things like soil erosion. My group actually looked at issues relating to water, things like sources such as rivers and wells and quality and so on. It was a good project to work on, but a bit frustrating. We felt we needed a lot more time, really. Right. Dr. Rowe did say something about limiting project scope. Yes, he told us that too at the beginning, and I can see why now. What else? Well, we had some good trips out as part of the course. We went to a market town, a place called Sigur. That was to study distribution. And to look at agricultural production, we went to the Weiwei Valley. That's an important agricultural region. And what about animals? Did you have a chance to go to a national park? Sure. We did a trip on the last day, on the way back to the airport at Nairobi. But actually, there was lots of wildlife at the field centre. Vervet monkeys and baboons and lizards. Mm, it does sound good. It was excellent, I'd say. In terms of logistics, it was very well run. But it was more than that. I mean, it's not the sort of place I'd ever have got to on my own. And it was a real eye-opener. It got me really interested in development issues and the way other people live. I did find it frustrating at the time that we couldn't get as far as we wanted on the project. But actually, I'm going to follow it up in my dissertation. So it's given me some ideas and data for that as well. So you'd say it was worth the extra money? Definitely. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture on fishing. First, look at questions 31 to 36. As you can see, there are four alternative answers, A, B, C and D, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. And in case you've forgotten, my name is Dr North from the Marine Habitat Research Unit at the University and I'm going to continue from the lecture that I gave a fortnight ago on humankind's relationship with the sea from a historical point of view and also on attitudes to different types of fishing. In today's talk, I would like to focus on the current problems in the fishing industry in Europe and, in particular, the present scarcity of marine fish. As with the last lecture, I've placed a book list a few relevant articles and a copy of this lecture on the department website. 
A statistic to begin with. Since the 1970s, stocks of the most heavily fished species have fallen on average by 90 percent. And why has this happened? Well, there's a chain of events which begins with the demographic changes that have taken place in the world over the last century. During this time, the world population has grown at a phenomenal rate. With efficient and heavy fishing, which is technology-driven, meeting the increasing demands for food. As a consequence, many fishing stocks in the European waters, from the Atlantic to the North Sea and the Mediterranean, are now on the verge of collapse. But the problem is not restricted to European waters. It's a situation that's all too clear all around the world. Fish stocks in the Pacific Ocean, for example. Are now on the verge of collapse due to a combination of overfishing and natural changes in ocean ecology, and there's another reason behind the increased demand for fish, and that is the changes in the eating patterns of different countries. Certain countries have a long tradition of fishing, for example, the southern European countries, but eating patterns have changed in countries like the United Kingdom. Where fish was once considered as food for the poor rather than the rich, people have been turning to fish as a cheap and healthy alternative to meat, driving up demand and depleting stocks. Food scares like BSE and foot and mouth disease have also driven people away from eating meat, which again is invariably replaced by fish. Before the speaker continues. Look at questions thirty-seven to forty. As you listen, complete the table. Write no more than three words for each answer. Another important reason is that a sizable proportion of the catch from modern trawlers or fishing boats is thrown away. Nets quite often land fish that are not wanted and which are thrown back into the sea dead. Discarded nets and other traps are responsible for the deaths of many fish. Our seas, like the rest of our environment, are littered with rubbish, which also destroys lots of fish. And fish are also being changed by the chemicals dumped into the oceans, as well as by overfishing. So the size of certain species is decreasing. More then have to be fished to produce a decent catch. And the solution? Well, there has to be more than one answer to the problem. Fish farms provide a partial solution, but the quality of the fish is usually inferior to those in the wild. Reducing the amount of fish that any one trawler or fishing boat is allowed to land is the most effective, but also the most unpopular measure. Countries in Europe, like Spain, rely heavily on fishing. And are naturally against any step which restricts their catch, but if the depletion of fishing stocks continues, there will be no fish left to fish. Take the disappearance of cod from the Great Banks off Newfoundland, which was once the richest cod fishing area in the Atlantic. After a dramatic fall in the cod population for some unknown reason, a ban was imposed, which it was hoped. Would lead to a repopulation of the cod stocks. The cod did not return, and many fishermen were put out of work. This is a scenario which we do not want to be repeated on a large scale. Now, if you look at this table on the screen, you can see where I. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.